I think I will be doing this in English since I'm from the northwest coast of Norway and I speak a <laughs> probably difficult dialect for you guys. Um, it's very cool to be here on World IPv6 Day since I'm uh, representing the content community and uh, the World IPv6 Day it's the content providers party. Of course everybody's invited so it's very good to see that so many people are coming. Um, right. So I'm working for Red Pill in Pro in Oslo. Uh, started out as a sysadmin with Unix, Linux, and stuff like that. But as we grew, we needed like specialized people, and I started with networking and uh, infrastructure. So back in 2008, I had very little to do, so I started looking into IPv6, and I've been kind of playing around with that ever since. So. Uh, if in the back you don't see the slides, they're available from that URL, the PDF, so you can download them and see. All right. Uh, Red Pill Impro is uh, a company uh, that's placed all over the Nordics. We have offices, many in Sweden and Denmark and Norway especially, and in Finland. We do pretty much everything that has to do with open source software. Uh, my department is working on hosting and application uh, maintenance for our customers. So it's typically content providers that don't have a, their own uh, IT infrastructure or IT department, and they want somebody to just take care of everything that has to do with the computers and the servers and the applications so that they can focus on providing content. Uh, and that's the part of the business that actually has a network to run and has IPv6. So uh, we are owned by an AB, uh, by Schette, and um, headquartered in Karlstad. Yes, so question. Uh, why should a content provider bother with IPv6? Uh, that's a very good question, actually, because there are pretty much no IPv6-enabled uh, users in Norway, uh, about 0.25%, and every one of those have IPv4 as well. So by enabling IPv6, we, don't, we are not reaching a new audience in any way. And uh, an interesting point in this graph, you can see uh, the drops in Christmas and in summer. Uh, it's because all of these people, or almost all of these people, are students in the student villages in Oslo and Trondheim. So when they leave for holiday, then the IPv6 usage is going down by about half. Uh, and this is not unique for Norway. This is my colleagues in Google's graph, and they're seeing this on a global scale. It's pretty much exactly the same number, 0.25%. Uh, so one in 400. But uh, there is still a reason for us to want to go to IPv6. And we have to look at the and the region internet users, or the internet users in general, to actually understand why that is. And here's an example of two of them. Uh, they have mobile broadband and GPS tracking, so they are actually connected to the internet. And for those of uh, or the people in Norway saying, ah, oh, Norway is a saturated market, we don't need more IP addresses, because everybody already has broadband and everybody has a phone, these are the new ones. So, uh, here's a crowd. They're happy, they're using IPv4, uh, which means that we can set up a web server that's already also IPv4, and everything works very well. Works very nice, they can access the content, and we deliver the content, and the advertisement, and everything, and yeah, works very well. The problem, however, happens when IPv4 depletion sets in, and we get into this situation, where we have a carrier-grade NAT in the network, because that's a bottleneck, uh, which means that we will not be able to serve content to our users as reliably as before. Uh, and that is something we are very concerned about. And some content providers are even are concerned about an even worse scenario, is that the ISP is going to take advantage of this situation by putting a competing content site inside of the NAT uh, and serve the users in that way. And uh, this has to do with network neutrality and everything like that, but there are some worries that the ISPs are going to go down that path, and thus 
making people that want to serve content over the internet at a disadvantage. Um, so we are really worried about carrier grade NAT and the extensive sharing of IP addresses that will lead to. As you can see from the picture, it works to actually share a resource that is bent for just one person with several, but it's not going to be very fast and it's not going to be very comfortable. Uh, we know that because uh, the CGNs need to keep track of the state of every flow in the network. And uh, the mobile carriers back home, they used to do that before, back when absolutely nobody was using the internet. Uh, over the 3G network, or the 2G network, as it was back then. And then suddenly, uh, Apple released that product that you, everybody uh, are aware of that made people use internet over the, the um, mobile network, and they kicked out the CGNs immediately because it did not work. It had two bad consequences on, on the user experience. Uh, so we want to avoid this scenario. We want to give our users the best possible performance, and CGNs is going to uh, be a, a problematic element in the path uh, when it comes to that. Also, we, there's another, also other problems like uh, geolocation. You can't really geolocate the users anymore uh, because the IP addresses belong to the CGNs, and they might be shared in between users all over the country, or all, all over the the continent for that matter. Uh, you can't do abuse the way, uh, or abuse handling, <laughs> mitigation, in the way you did before, because you can't block an IP address, you can't trace an IP address anymore. Uh, and IPv6 is a solution to all of these problems because it restores the direct path between the content and the end user uh, that was lost when the CGNs was introduced into the network. So the content providers really wants IPv6 in the future, even though there is no, no reason for it, like direct reason for it right now. So what we do then? Uh, uh, we try to break the chicken and the egg uh, scenario. Uh, because an ISP can easily say that, why should we bother with, with IPv6 when there, are, when there is no content available over it? And uh, likewise, the content providers say, if there is no end users, why should we bother with IPv6? And then you're stuck in a loop where, which you never get out of, unless somebody actually just steps up and just does it. And the content providers has done so. Uh, there are a tremendous amount of content available over IPv6 on the internet today. It's all from small, small companies like the Soap Trail, which is my girlfriend's soap uh, store and to Google and YouTube and, and Akamai and all those big ones. And you can see also the picture there is the Norwegian parliament, which I was told in the break actually that they had deployed V6. So there's something for Riksdagen to follow. Um, so we went ahead and did it, basically. And just to put the ball squarely in the in the court of the, the ISPs and saying, no, it's your turn to follow suit. Um, but we have been talking about dual stack brokenness a little bit before. That's really the only uh, good reason for a content provider to say, no, we don't want IPv6. And the problem here is that you have the users that think that they have access to the IPv6 internet, and they have access to the IPv4 internet, and as, soon, as long as the server is IPv4 only, this is no problem because the defective IPv6 connectivity is never attempted. But as soon as you, you uh, uh, announce a quad A record on the server, the client will start using the defective IPv6 connectivity in preference to the IPv4 connectivity. Then there's a timeout. It can be from 20 seconds to three minutes. And if it doesn't work, then it fails over to the uh, IPv4 or the second IPv6 address, if you have more of them, and uh, the page loads ever so slowly. Too slow for most users, they'll probably just give up and go somewhere else. So that means that since there are no IPv6 only users, you're not reaching any new users by adding IPv6. However, you're actually decreasing the amount of IPv4 only users that can reach you since there are those that believe that they have 
they have IPv6 while they don't. And that's a disincentive for the content providers to actually deploy because we want to serve as many users as possible. That's how they make their money. Um, so we decided uh, after we had deployed v6 in our data centers to like look at this to see if it was actually doable to deploy v6 or if the brokenness problem was too great uh, and try to figure out what was causing it specifically and if there was something that could be done to fix it. So we asked uh, VG, which is the largest Norwegian website, it's a tabloid, uh, and Aprasen, which is a media house that has, I think, around 70 different local newspapers. So it's together, I think, it's the fourth largest site in Norway. And uh, we try to use their visitors, which are completely non-technical, average Norwegian users, to figure out what are the problems. And we also shared the results of this experiment with anybody that was interested in learning about it. Um, so what we did was to actually include a little invisible iframe on, uh, on the home pages of those sites in question, uh, which in turn linked to two image files, uh, one that is IPv4 only as a reference, and one that is IPv6 or uh, dual stacked. Uh, and also the iframe was IPv4 only. So the assumption is that we will see the equal amount of hits to dual stack PNG, uh, the image file, and to the uh, IPv4 only image file. And if we did, then we know that there is no additional problem that is caused by dual stacking the, the element. But if there are, for some reason, fewer hits to the dual stacked uh, element than it is to the IPv4 element, then there is a reason for that that has to do with the dual stacking itself. Uh, and that's how we calculated it. The 100% the is the amount of users that, or the hits to the iframe, and uh, the spread between the hits to the IPv4 only image and the dual stacked image uh, is what we call the amount of brokenness. Um, and as you can see, in this, this is an example, made up numbers, you have a, a brokenness of half a percent. Because we did, after all, produce an identical number of links to those two PNGs. Um, so when we started, we figured out that uh, there was about 0.2 to 0.3 percent brokenness uh, overall. Um, this was considered to be too much by those uh, uh, providers, VG and Apresen, so we didn't go ahead and deploy. Uh, but we continued measuring and kind of looked more into the numbers and tried to uh, figure out what was going on. And we saw that the Opera web browser, when it was running on Windows, was significantly overrepresented in the, in the last uh, hits to the dual stack image. And so was all of Mac OS X machines. And also, especially certain ISPs or enterprises, typically university networks or uh, enterprise networks and so on, not so much uh, broadband ISPs. Um, and we also saw that uh, almost all of the IPv6 traffic we got was tunneled, transitional IPv6 traffic. Um, and the Microsoft guy that was talking before me talked a bit about this. And uh, like I said, it's the point of it is to be able to reach an IPv6 only service over an IPv4 only network. If the service is dual stacked, there is absolutely no reason to be using a uh, transitional IPv6 in preference to to um, yeah, just regular IPv4. And uh, there's a good reason for that, <laughs> because trans transitional IPv6, it sucks. It's really, really terrible in terms of reliability. And there has been uh, re research into this uh, lately, and they've determined that some almost one in five uh, accesses over tunneled IPv6 failed in one certain failure mode where you actually can see the inbound SYN packet, but you never get a reply to your outbound SYN ACK packet. And even if it works, uh, it, it can be really terrible even so. For instance, I heard today that if you're trying to use 6 to 4 from NTT uh, in Japan, 
your packets are then transmitted to a relay in, in London and then returned over the IPv6 internet to the IPv6 site you're going to in Japan. And the return packet might also be subjected to such a, a, a roundabout way of getting to its destination. Same thing I heard about Torito. Uh, guy in Australia, the, the guy from APNIC that was researching this, uh, found out that his packets went to Europe, I think it was to Amsterdam, so it might have been to the uh, relay there, before going back to their destination. Uh, so even if it works, it's, it has so many failure modes that it's absolutely no reason that you would want to use it over IPv4 if it's available. So the problem we found out with uh, Opera uh, on Windows is that it has its own resolver library. And as was mentioned, Windows uh, machines will automatically enable 64 and Torito, but it has a, a system resolver that, smartly enough, will depref it so that it's not used in preference to IPv4. But when an application such as Opera uses its own built-in resolver, which don't have those considerations, it will start using uh, 64 uh, or Torito over it instead. Um, Opera got this fixed in March last year, and as you can see, the, the red line there uh, shows the, the actual measured overall brokenness in percent for the, all of our data. And the green line shows the exact same calculation, only that we removed all hits from Opera first. So you can see that the green line is pretty much flat, but after Opera upgraded uh, their browser, um, the actual brokenness dropped in half almost. And we could also see that the uh, amount of transitional IPv6 traffic uh, dropped significantly. And uh, today, there are almost no affected Opera users left in the internet. There are some, but there are so few that these two lines uh, pretty much overlap. Um, and then you have Mac OS X, same type of problem. They, it uses transitional IPv6 over over uh, uh, IPv4 if it's available. That's because Mac OS X does not implement that RFC that says to sort addresses and avoid using transitional IPv6. It does not do it by default itself, but if there is another router in the network that announces itself to the, the network that I'm a router, and here's the prefix, and it's the transitional uh, IPv6 prefixes, Macros X would use it. Um, so, uh, and that is also a very common problem, which I will get to so shortly. <coughs> and uh, we got them to kind of fix that back in November. It's, it's not really a full implementation of that RFC, that RFC 3484 that tells you to sort the addresses, but it actually is a hack that says, if there is a 64 address on the system, we just flip the order so that IPv4 is always preferred, even though there's also a native address on the system. But it says, if there's 64 here, we're not doing anything with IPv6, unless we have to. Uh, and you see the, the same pattern when they upgraded or the release the patch for this, you see the, the brokenness, actual brokenness in the internet dropped significantly. Um, so unfortunately, that is, there's still a spread between the OSX users or the internet as a whole and the internet without OSX. So OSX is still overrepresented. And that's mainly because this fix has not made it to the previous two versions of OSX, the, the Tiger and Leopard, I believe it is. And if you're using a PowerPC OS X machine, you can't upgrade to the fixed version. Um, and the Rogue RA has also been mentioned. It's when uh, a router advertises itself as, or a machine usually, advertises itself as a router to the local network. Uh, and that typically happens with the 64 prefix. This cannot happen with Torido, since Torido gives you only one address, but it uh, will happen with 64, since you have a complete prefix. And um, if the network uh, this happens on is firewalling the, the tunnel packets, which is common in enterprise networks or in, in university networks, then all the Mac OS X hosts that will receive this RA and prefer this connectivity will have no way of accessing a dual stack site without first waiting for a timeout. And we saw that uh, in 
in the University of Oslo student village networks, we had almost one in ten hits uh, overall uh, failed uh, to the dual stack test image. And uh, we, if we had only looked at Mac OS X, the, it would have probably been up in the 60, 80 percent. Um, and the most uh, often seen reason for these ROG RAs is uh, internet connection sharing, which was mentioned earlier, I think for you, um, as it will automatically enable um, 64. And if you have at some point enabled internet connection sharing, uh, for instance, if you went to the cabin and wanted to share your 3G network with the Wi-Fi, for instance, and you go back and connect it to a a enterprise network, it will announce itself as a router to the enterprise network. And um, since Mac OS X doesn't know how to uh, make a prioritize the, the types of IPv6 connectivity, it breaks. Um, and uh, I'm kind of disappointed in Microsoft for not having fixed this because I've been talking to them about it for quite some time. But uh, I have some indications that they are going to look at it soon. Um, and also you have uh, CPE devices that does 64 um, by default. Uh, of course, that is more likely to work if it's in an ISP environment, but uh, you still have the disadvantages of 64. And when, when it's being used in preference to IPv4, you have a lot of failures. And uh, unfortunately, that's one of the requirements for, I think, Vista compatible uh, home routers is to do 64 by default. Uh, and I also have some indications that they're going to change that spec, but uh, it hasn't happened yet. So, uh, but I, I, I'd like to kind of uh, uh, level that out and say congratulations to Microsoft for actually making a desktop OS that actually works out of the box on an IPv6 network. So these are one of the bugs, but they have been doing a good job too. So I'm not trying to bash them. Um, uh, in addition, the kind of the new uh, found uh, knowledge about 64 has made the IETF go out and basically deprecate it, or it's about it just in the last editorial phases. And even the original author of 64 fully s supported the deprecation document without reservation. So that's that's quite telling. Um, so back in October. Um, we decided that, okay, nothing much has ha happened since we, we um, or Opera got fixed. And we know that Apple is going to fix uh, the preference problem in 10.6.5 when that is due out. So we decided to do a 24-hour test. And that's exactly the same thing as is happening today on the global scale. And it was a copy of something that was done in Germany uh, the month before. So I got both of my customers to simultaneously enable it. Or actually, I got permission to enable it simultaneously on both of my customers. Uh, and then we saw what happened. And I remember that, that uh, the biggest site, VG, told me that, OK, you can do this, but you have to go come to our office, and you have to be sitting next to the phone at all times and be ready for the telephone uh, storm. And uh, well. What happened was that we got one email the day after wondering what was going on with VG the day before. That was all. Um, so we decided that uh, this looks okay. We'll just wait for the OS X fix, and then we will uh, we'll, uh, let that kind of be installed in the user's homes, and then we will go live. And we did that right before Christmas last year. Uh, we also put up a JavaScript to try to detect those broken users and send them to a site we'd set up, which did a test and advised them to do this or that for in order to fix it, like typically upgrade your Opera or uh, upgrade OS X. Um, so that's kind of been the development in the brokenness since we started measuring it uh, until we actually went into production, which uh, and uh, when we went into production, we decided that it was okay with 0.025%. And that, oh, I can't remember how many out of 10,000 that is, but it's, yeah. In any case, not that many. There's still a few, but. And uh, last month, I actually disabled IPv6 again to do a new measurement. 
because when we turn on IPv6 for the main site, the broken users will be lost at, at that point. I won't actually make it to the measurement system. So we can't measure them, we lose the insight. That's a kind of a problem, but um, if we kind of move beyond the brokenness problem uh, completely, then who cares? And in any case, uh, it has gone down more. Um, so last month it was at 0 0.015, which is 1 in 6,660 something users. Because there has been some other fixes, minor fixes. And we are hoping for some more. There's bugs in Windows, as I've been mentioning, and uh, also in, in OS X that hasn't been fixed yet. But I think Lion, Microsoft X Lion, will be, have all the known fixes. So, uh, World IPv6 Day, it's probably why we chose this date for this event. Um, it's actually the exactly same thing as we did in October. Uh, all of the uh, content providers that are participating, uh, they have um, decided to at least turn it on for 24 hours and turn it back off again. Reason for this is because they're afraid of the broken users and, and giving a bad user experience to to their uh, their users. And um, since it's being done simultaneously, you, it's a shared fate. What Google, for instance, is very worried about is that if a user sees one day that Google is down, he'll go into his browser and change the default search engine to Bing, or vice versa. That's why I don't dare to do it alone. But uh, as long as they do it all at the same time, the, the risk is lower, and then it's easier to get management approval. And uh, one, another uh, reason was to actually get so many big names aboard, so that if a user actually had problems, it uh, would be experienced as the internet doesn't work. So let's call my ISP and get help, instead of actually saying, oh, okay, that site was down, let's go somewhere else today. Um, and since we have did this before, we've kind of participated in the planning from the start. Uh, we're not participating directly ourselves, we, since we've already been there, done that, but we kind of have a way of participating, which is that we can, f we can host you if you want to have IPv6 for your website. Um, right. So... Uh, Will the internet break? Uh, that was what people were really afraid of, that this will come be a disaster. Uh, I don't think so. Or, and I was right. Uh, <laughs> I've been talking to all of these people in Google and Facebook and so on throughout the day, and they're saying that, well, this was boring. Nothing happened. <laughs> but then again, that's the best outcome possible. So uh, th that means that it's not not that terrible or frightening to actually deploy it, even for a global provider. Of course, there's been some hitches, but most of them have actually been content providers that have, uh, that have botched, botched their own deployment for some reason. For instance, Level 3 for some time, if you went to their site over IPv6, you just got a 404. That's one problem. Or Juniper managed to botch their entire DNS so that the site went down both for V4 and V6 users. But those are actually big problems that happened today, not, not the broken users. So, and that was exactly what we had in October. Audun Itteral, that's the, the uh, IT manager at VG, and he was also disappointed that there was more action, and that was back in October before Mac OS X got fixed. So, no big surprise for me. Uh, but if there actually are people you hear about that had problems today, uh, the blanket recommendations would be to actually use one of the test sites that uh, exist in order to, um, to uh, determine if IPv6 is the issue or there's something else that is the issue. And if so, just make sure that things are upgraded, especially then Opera, Firefox, it has a bug uh, if in old versions, Mac OS X as well, and some firmware of some uh, common uh, routers. And uh, my recommendations for all Windows users is to disable IPv6, uh, tunneled IPv6, I'm sorry. Uh, and unless they actually have a 
a uh, need for it that they are aware of. Like you, my grandma should not have tunneled IPv6 by default. Um, and also disable internet connection sharing, and that's especially if you have a Mac host on the same network that that uh, is experiencing problems, because then you might be affected by that rogue RA bug. Um, and if there's still problems, uh, you can use Chrome, which implements uh, glosses over the entire problem by doing IPv6 and IPv4 in almost parallel, and by just using whatever works. And there are some other issues you can go see that links uh, for the full list. I've tried to document it for the community as best as I can. And if nothing works, then disable IPv6 is the, the way out, unfortunately. But I think very, very, very few users actually have to do that. All right, so that's, I hope, that's the last time I ever spoke about IPv6 brokenness. So you guys are privileged. Uh, I want to move past that and move towards just deployment and more happy stuff. Um, so how did we actually deploy? It's the next part. Um, one way of doing uh, an IPv6 deployment for a content site is to, is to retrofit it by having a, a proxy in front, a proxy or a, a NAT system that actually accepts incoming IPv6 traffic and then rewrites it to IPv4 and then sends it to whatever IPv4 only system you have in the back. Uh, and that's kind of very easy to do. Uh, you need to have adequate performance on the translator, of course, especially if you suddenly get more IPv6 traffic overnight. Um, and one advantage is that you can actually outsource this function to somebody else uh, because the traffic between the proxy and the web server can run over the internet. Of course, that's not recommended if there is a long distance between the two, but if it's in the same town with fiber in between, then no problem. And we do this for Høyre, the Norwegian Conservative Party. They have exactly this system and it works very well. Uh, another problem is that uh, the source IP address of all incoming connections will appear to be from the proxy instead of the real uh, IPv6 end user. But you can use headers if you are using a layer 7 proxy in order to actually pass that information on. Um, the other way is to actually do just dual stack. Wherever there's IPv4 and there is external IPv4 connectivity, you just enable IPv6. That, of course, requires your web server or your load balancer or whatever it is that the end user is connecting to to support IPv6 as well as it supports IPv4. Uh, I know that for most open source software web servers, that's no problem. Uh, VG is using a load balancer from F5 Networks, which has no problems with IPv6 either. Uh, and that's how we did it for most of our customers that have IPv6 enabled in our data center. It works very well, it's easy. Uh, and uh, kind of the only problem with it is that you have to um, have two protocols everywhere. And that's an overhead, both in maintenance and monitoring and uh, things that can go wrong. So. The actual deployment, the, the configuration of IPv6 for, for, uh, for VGN for Appleson was just a couple of hours each. It's very easy to do if you're f the front end of the site supports IPv6. Then it's just a matter of some config and it's done. And then you don't have to bother about actually changing all the servers in the back, like database servers or file servers or whatever, they can still speak IPv4 internally, and that's no problem. As long as the, the end user can access you over IPv6 as well as you can over IPv4, then you've kind of done what needs to be done. Um, and what I want to try, instead of talking about brokenness, uh, I want to try actually disabling IPv6, com no, IPv4 completely, and set up a system <laughs> with web servers and file servers or whatever it is, a normal uh, commercial customer with only IPv6 in his server network. Uh, and that is uh, in order to avoid the overhead with dual stack. I have, want to have one firewall uh, rule set to, to uh, configure. I want to do 
have uh, one set of monitoring. I want to have one set of IGP adjacencies. And of, as I was mentioning earlier, there is actually a, a fix for that coming in an extension to OSPF version 3. But if Cisco doesn't even know if they're going to support it or not, then, then uh, that might take a while before I can actually deploy it. And also the routing tables will re be reduced. People are telling me that you need to go remain dual stacked for, for 10 or 20 years. You can never turn it off. But I don't, simply don't believe that to be true. As long as you provide some kind of uh, connectivity for the IPv4 end users, you can go IPv6 only on the actual servers. That's what. Yeah. I actually did my homework and checked you did? on OSPF. Oh. Yeah, Wonderful. and we have support for that in July this year on, uh, on iOS, and the other variants of iOS is coming up quite quickly. But they won't help, because you'll still have dual instances. You, have, you can have different address families, but you still have to have two OSPF processes. You have to have okay. one for v4 and one for v6. So but it's not so it's actually two address families in one process. There's separate instances of but OSPF. But the instances are those still separate? No, you'll have separate. OK. Well. And I have to strike that point from the slide next time. So then, then even better a reason for doing going uh, IPv6 only, because I can't get away from having dual adjacencies as long as I'm dual stacked. Um, and the way I want to do that is by using a, a stateless uh, translation, which is a, a RFC standard. Uh, it currently the RFC requires that you have a special addressing format, which should be easy to lift, and I'm talking to some Cisco guys about actually trying to do that. And the, the basic idea is to, to have a, a box in your network, probably in your core network, or could possibly be running on one of your core routers, uh, where a IPv4 address, like the, this one, is routed to that translator. Uh, and of course, the IPv4 end user is just connecting to that address because it's published in DNS. Uh, and this one does the standard stateless translations. You see, it rewrites the source address. The IPv4 source address is rewritten to an IPv6 source address, which has the original IPv4 address included in it. And then I want to do a, a uh, static mapping in the config of this box here, which rewrites the destination address to a um, predefined IPv6 uh, destination address. That's what's missing in the RFC, but it should not be a very difficult thing to add. Um, and uh, then this uh, packet is then just routed to the web server as normally, and processed by the web server as a IPv6 packet like any other. And of course, returned to its original IPv6 source address, which is then routed to could be the same uh, translator or could be another one, um, as long as it has the same config, which just does the uh, translations in reverse uh, and returns it to the IPv4 end user. So the IPv4 end user won't know that this happened, and the server won't know that it happened unless it actually wants to, because it can be taught to detect that this prefix is a mapped uh, IPv4 user. And since you actually can fit all of the IPv4 address in the, in the IPv6 address. You can do geolocation, and you can do uh, log, logging of the original IPv4 address instead of the mapped IPv6 address, and so on. And uh, since this can be done stateless per packet, there's no need for these boxes to keep state, so it's just an a extra function of routing you don't get any performance degradation. It can be accelerated in hardware, and they don't need to have state like a CGN or a stateful NAT device has. Um, and I think that's a very kind of elegant solution. It looks very elegant in my lab in, in, in my head. And uh, I believe that this is something that could be successfully deployed. Um, but I need a little bit of code change in, in uh, iOS, if I want to use, uh, use it. So the advantages would be to that it's, it's, uh, I don't have to uh, think about dual stack for the servers or the, 
or the front ends or the uh, network in between the core network and the actual server network. It can be all IPv6 only. And since it's stateless, like I said, performance is not an issue with this. And uh, I have the IPv4 address still, so everything I can do with an original IPv4 source address I can do with this as long as I teach the application to strip the first 96 bytes. Uh, bits, of course, sorry. Um, and another thing is that that allows me to do IPv6 only on all the servers, the database servers and the file servers and whatever. They need IPv4 addresses today. And as you all know, we are out of IPv4 addresses. And I'm not about to start doing NAT in a data center. That sounds like a madman to me. Uh, and um, if I do this, I can free up hundreds of IP addresses from my, my uh, a customer and use that as individual service addresses that are mapped to individual, uh, individual IPv6 only servers and or customers. So, and of course, the final benefit is that it, it treats IPv4 as, as a backwards compatibility uh, issue. So, if I have a, uh, instead of doing the opposite way, where I translate IPv6 to an IPv4 only system, where I can only expect the, the load on the translators to actually increase as ISPs deploy IPv6. Here, the actual load on the translators will decrease over time as traffic moves to native v6. So it's kind of the forward-looking approach, which allows you to actually turn off IPv6, no, IPv4 in the end, or actually just leave it as a compatibility function in kind of the corner of your data center that you can just leave there. So I'm hoping that uh, the guys I'm talking to in Cisco is willing to to work with me and getting actually running code that can do this. And I need a, a customer that is willing to actually do some pioneering work and try uh, to see if this actually works. Um, I'm on time, ah, good. That's almost the end. Uh, so I'll just continue doing what I've been doing, trying to dual stack the customers that are IPv4 only today. Um, hopefully do some research into IPv6 only uh, deployments instead of research into brokenness, which is just depressing. Uh, and uh, trying to push ISPs and push awareness and so on, both home and internationally. And uh, I think that when the end users start showing up, then uh, the, the ball will start rolling and we actually get some, some real uh, deployments going. So, uh, and also because IP, no, World IPv6 Day turned out to be an anti-climax anti as I expected, there's not any real reason I think anymore that a content provider should be worried about actually dual stacking. So if it, it's possible for a content provider, if he gets the option doing it by default from his provider or it's a simple retrofit of uh, IPv6 to his systems. There's no reason why I should be afraid of doing it, as so many people have been because of the brokenness issue up until now. So that's it. Uh, I leave with a, a graph I like to show. Uh, it's the amount of uh, IPv6 enabled ASS, or which means ISPs or enterprises or or big uh, content providers and so on, how percentage of those, how many, have actually acquired an IPv6 pre prefix and is actually actively routing it in the global table uh, per country. And as you can see, Sweden is there. So you are in kind of the Scandinavian group here of Sweden, Denmark, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, about one-fifth. And uh, I think I, of course, I can't uh, take all credit for it, but I think that the work that has been done in Norway with promoting V6 both in terms of real deployments and actually having awareness building has caused us to go from uh, quite mediocre to top in the world uh, within a, a couple of years. And uh, I'd like to challenge you to catch up with us to the next time I come here. So you can't have this. Uh, Right. So that's uh, the end of my presentation. Uh, that's
some IPv6 enabled guys, as you can see. Uh, they seem to have lots of questions. I'm hoping that you do as well. Uh, how many protocols have you tried this on except HTTP, FTP or SIP and stuff like that? Uh, what do you mean by this? Uh, well, uh, for example, FTP using passive mode and stuff uh, like are that. Are you talking about the, the, the IPv6 uh, yeah. only operation? Yeah. yeah. For FTP, you would probably need an, an uh, ALG uh, in order for it to work. Uh, so, like the first step I would want, want to try this with is kind of HTTP or some other very strictly server to client uh, protocol that doesn't keep any information about its uh, endpoint IPv6 address within the protocol itself. Because uh, FTP might be a challenge. But then again, the rewriting rules is very simple. Uh, and uh, if you have a the ALG or the, the translation support for FTP specifically in in uh, the translators, it should work just fine. Except if you're using encrypted FTP, which in which case you have a problem. Any others? Mm -hmm. So I can uh, understand. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <coughs>